Good morning, church. Good morning, Toby. Thank you. From the back there and from everyone here. Welcome to St. Mary's Church, Attenborough. Welcome to probably the coolest venue um, around at the moment, if you'll pardon the pun, as it were. Um, I do hope that you're, you know, I think it, it, it's not too warm in here at the moment, but I will just say, if at any point you are feeling a bit thirsty, a bit parched, um, there's a tap, there's glasses um, up there, and if you make your way up, there'll certainly be someone just to help you get a glass of water if, if need be. Um, I don't mean to panic everyone or whatever, but if you just need that bit of refreshment, please don't feel awkward just going to the back and getting a glass of water. May I say welcome to everyone, of course, but a particularly warm welcome to those of you who are uh, joining us for the first time, those of you who are visiting or have just been dipping your toe in the water here at St. Mary's. It's really wonderful to have you with us. Uh, and a particularly strong welcome to our baptism party. It's a joy to welcome uh, Sarah and James Downs and Elsie Downs, friends and family, as we will shortly come to celebrate the baptism of Elsie, which is always a wonderful thing to do, remembering our own call to be part of church and to celebrate someone else's marking of being part of the church family together. And then after that, later on, we will continue in our sermon series looking at Exodus. We've been looking at a, a series called Journeying with God, and we're going to be looking at Exodus 13 today. And Ali, one of our ministers, is going to be preaching to us on that passage, thinking about what it means to be set apart for God. So we look forward to that later. But before we come to sing, to lift our voices to God, let's just take a moment to pause and open with a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, as we look forward to celebrating the gift of baptism together, we thank you that you have called each and every one of us here to be a part of your body, the body of Christ, the hands and feet and the work of Jesus on earth. You've called us into unity as a family to worship you and to live our lives following you and knowing your love for each of us here. So I pray, come Holy Spirit, be present with us, fill us afresh, May we be a joyful people who come to praise your name. Bless us and give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this morning, that we might learn from you and become more like your son, Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. So may I invite you to stand as you're able, and we're going to sing together with our first hymn, Praise My Soul the King of Heaven. Let's worship together.
Please do be seated. As we come together to bow down before our great, holy, and loving God, we bring ourselves to Him in our humanity, in our vulnerability, and in our weakness, recognizing that we're not always able to live the life that God calls us to. And we do sin, we do offend God, we do hurt one another, and indeed ourselves. And it's important to be honest about that. But we come before a gracious, loving, and merciful God who wants to pour out his spirit of forgiveness in our lives and his love afresh. So let's just pause for a moment of quiet to bring those things that we know we've done, thought, or said before God, and we'll make our confession together. gospel calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. As we offer ourselves to him in penitence and faith, we renew our confidence and trust in his mercy. So we say together, Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Savior, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to sort of turn yourselves, to scooch around a bit to face the font as we come to our baptism. Anyone else who wants a little look in <laughs> around the font? If children want to come and come around the font, you're more than welcome. Everyone is welcome. <coughs> Hopefully you can all see. And uh, hopefully you've all got a baptism sheet, or at least you can see one, so you can follow on in the words. Because as much as a lot of it is between myself, the parents, and the godparents, there are some really important um, things that the whole church says as we welcome Elsie into this family. So I say to Elsie, but the parents will respond on behalf of Elsie, do you wish to be baptized Faith is the gift of God to his people. And in baptism, the Lord is adding to our number those whom he is calling. So I say to all of you, the people of God, will you welcome Elsie and uphold her in her new life in Christ? Parents and godparents, the church receives Elsie with joy. Today we are trusting God for her growth in faith. Will you pray for her? Will you draw her by your example into the community of faith? And will you walk with her in the way of Christ? In baptism, God calls us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. To follow Christ means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. 
Therefore I ask, do you reject the devil and all rebellion against God? Do you renounce the deceit and corruption of evil? Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and neighbor? Do you turn to Christ as Savior? Do you submit to Christ as Lord? Do you come to Christ, the way, the truth, and the life? If you just bring Elsie over here, if you hold her. Elsie, Christ claims you for his own. Receive the sign of the cross. Do not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified. We say together. Fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin, the world, and the devil, and remain faithful to Christ to the end of your life. So may Almighty God deliver you from the powers of darkness, restore in you the image of his glory, and lead you in the light and obedience to Christ. Amen. So we continue. Praise God who made heaven and earth, who keeps his promises forever. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. We thank you, almighty God, for the gift of water to sustain, refresh, and cleanse all life. Over water, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through water, you led the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. In water, your son Jesus received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us from the death of sin to the newness of life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we baptize into his fellowship those who come to him in faith. Now, sanctify this water, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, they may be cleansed from sin and born again. Renewed in your image, may they walk by the light of faith and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. So let us affirm together as a church and with those who are being baptized our common faith together in Jesus Christ. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here we go. Here we go. So far, so good. All right. Quickly, quickly. Elsie Kate Downs, I baptize you in the name of of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May God, who has received you by baptism into his church, pour upon you the riches of his grace, that within the company of Christ's pilgrim people, you may be daily renewed by his anointing spirit, and come to the inheritance of the saints in glory. Amen. Amen. Excellent. I'm going to just pass you back over there. Thank you. Bless you. There you go. 
And so, new candles always take a while. There we go. So, Elsie, receive this Bible as a guide for your life. And this candle as a symbol of the light of Christ. Walk in this light all the days of your life. Shine as a light in the world to the glory of God the Father. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. LC, by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. And we say together, we welcome you into the fellowship of faith. We are children of the same Heavenly Father. We welcome you. Let's give a round of applause, shall we? <laughs> Wonderful. So please do be seated. And may I invite everybody to turn back around to the front. We're going to continue to worship together, so don't sit down just yet. Unless you want to, of course. You're very, you're very welcome to remain seated. We love to uh, worship not just with our voices, but with actions as well, although I appreciate it's quite a warm day, so... Um, no pressure if, you're, uh, if it's going to make you sweat buckets. But we're going to sing Our God is a Great Big God, which is a lovely, well-known song. And I haven't even asked for anyone to come back. We've got our volunteers who are going to come. Woo! Thank you so much. My glamorous assistants, and maybe even Ali, and Nigel, and, half, and all the church. <laughs> so let's just have a bit of fun, and let's worship God together through actions with Our God is a Great Big God. Um, do stand if you're able, and if you'd like to join in with the actions, go for it. If it's too warm, no problem. now after that. So as we come to worship God in sung praise, we also come to pray to God, to ask him for his provision and to lift up to him the needs of not only our community, but the country and the globe as well. So I'm going to invite Andrew 
to lead us in our prayers together. Thank you, Andrew. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of the world, for the diversity of wildlife, the peace and joy it brings to so many. Help individuals, companies and governments work together to find ways to enable humanity to thrive on this planet alongside nature rather than its expense. We pray for those caught up in conflict in the world thinking particularly at this time of those in Ukraine, in Yemen, and in Ethiopia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the Queen, those in our government, both local and national, Parliament, and the civil service. We ask that whomever our new Prime Minister is, that their heart will be open to be guided by your love and that they may choose a cabinet dedicated to pursuing goals of justice and of compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church here in Attenborough, for Toby, our readers, choir, bell ringers, everybody who gives their time for St. Mary's. And we pray for all Christians throughout the world, especially those persecuted for their faith, and ask that all countries embrace the toleration and freedoms that we enjoy in the United Kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, especially Geraldine and Steve, Mary, Haley, Ella, Dorothy, Aidan, Les, and Jill. And we also pray for any particularly known to us. We ask your blessing on those who care for them, healthcare workers, family, and friends. And we particularly ask your blessing upon young carers. We remember the departed, and we hold up to you their families, colleagues, and friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, St. Mary's visionary prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you love Attenborough and you love St. Mary's Church. We ask that you guide us by your Holy Spirit to discern the vision you have for us. Teach us what it means to reach out to the wider community with your love, to grow new and younger disciples, and to deepen our faith together. Bless us with courage strength and grace to partner with you in your mission for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. The colic for the day. Almighty God, send down upon your church the riches of your spirit and kindle in all who minister the gospel your countless gifts of grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from Exodus chapter 13. 
the Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male, the first offspring of every womb amongst you, the Israelites, belongs to me, whether human or animal. Then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today, in the month of Aviv, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hevites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days, eat bread made without yeast. And on the seventh day, hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days. Nothing with yeast in it is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance for you will be like a sign on your hand, and a reminder on your forehead that this law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time, year after year. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised on oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the womb. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Andrew, for those prayers. And well done, Peter, in not getting your words mixed up there. A land of hilk and money. I wonder what your views are about who should be our next Prime Minister. Or, indeed, what makes a good Prime Minister. Now, these last few weeks, and to be honest, years, have been a unique period in British politics where so much has happened as our beloved Boris has led us out of the European Union, then through COVID, and sadly into a time where food poverty is a reality, and as his premiership is ending, when Britain is on the sidelines of a war in Europe. An exodus, a plague, famine, and war. Sound familiar? Yes, history in the 21st century somehow is resonating with what we hear of the Israelites in the story of the Exodus and how Moses took on Pharaoh and led God's people out of Egypt and towards the promised land. Now, the last time I was asked to speak on Exodus was three weeks ago, and at that point in the story, a disillusioned Moses had been knocked back by Pharaoh and told that his people would remain as slaves and the living and working conditions would be made much, much worse. And they were. Moses, if you remember, told God what he thought of the situation and God reminded him of his promise that the Israelites would reach the promised land. Trust in me, says the Lord. And now, in chapter 13, we can see the outworkings of Moses' leadership. God, through Moses, had been faithful. They were out of slavery, away from Pharaoh, but not quite yet in the promised land. 
but the evidence of God at work in their community was there for all to see. Maybe it's a bit like Brexit, still a work in progress. Not quite there yet. But God's promises can be trusted. It's a message as old as the scriptures, but a message that we as Christians need reminding of day in, day out. Moses is at a halfway point. They're free, but they're not quite there. There's a lot still to be done. There's a mighty Red Sea ahead and years in the wilderness. But God wants them to know again and again that they can trust in him and in his promises. And that's the message of the first part of this reading. Now, I was grateful to Charlie last week for his talk on the Passover. And I remember looking at Joan as we sat together in the choir at the passage as it repeated the same instruction over and over again. This was chapter 12. There must be no yeast in your house, no risen bread, nothing made with yeast. And I remember Joan just whispering in my ear, seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? And I agreed. Now, the thing about the writings in the Old Testament is that they sometimes repeat the same thing, the same instruction over and over again. And Charlie was quite right when he said last week that there's nothing in chapter 13 that hasn't been said in chapter 12. The instruction about dedicating the firstborn son to God, the instruction about what to eat over the Passover night and the following week, all of it is repeated from the previous chapter. And I remember a tutor in the Old Testament module when I was training, say, training saying, it's a little bit like a Bruce Forsyth moment. Nice to see you. And again, to see you, nice. Again, it's a repetition. And it's solely there, it's not there by accident, it's solely there to emphasize how important this passage is and how important these instructions are. Now, the other lesson I remember from my Old Testament classes was that we were challenged to look beyond the details, beyond the literal story, and to find out what it says about God. Why the unleavened bread? In both chapters, why no yeast? Why this festival? What does it all mean? And what does it say about God? And it comes back yet again to the same message. God's promises can be trusted. The unleavened bread, a reminder that they left Egypt in a hurry. That by following God's instruction, they could not rest or camp long enough for the dough to rise. And that God was bringing them out of slavery and into a land of milk and honey. Verse 5 again, and I asked Melissa to read that uh, because her voice is nicer than mine. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey. It's not literal. When God's people land in Israel, there aren't magic honey trees or milk cartons hanging from every lamppost. It's a picture of God's promised goodness. In reality, it means that God is promising a land that will be fertile, a land ideal for raising goats and cows, and thus they would be full of milk. Similarly, flowing with honey means the bees had plants to pollinate and there would be agricultural prosperity. It was God's promise of God's goodness And when this promise is delivered later in the story, the ceremony, this ceremony, the ceremony of the Passover and the week that follows, the week of unleavened bread, reminds them and us that God can be trusted and his promises are always delivered. So when they're in the land of milk and honey, that reminds them of God's promises and his goodness to them. Modern day Jews still take this instruction to heart. Families still gather around the dinner table at dusk on the feast of the Passover. And I love the tradition that parents and children have a role to play in retelling their story. Thanking God for their freedom and praying for those who are still under oppression. Now another A man who's been in the news a lot this week, and you'll have followed the story of Mo Farah, Farah, a real-life story of a boy living in slavery who, through the intervention of his teacher and the school, found freedom. And with that freedom, he became the most decorated Olympic athlete in our country's history. 
It's a story of liberation and empowerment, liberated from domestic slavery and empowered to, be the, to become the best that he could be. And yes, that's what the Israelites are celebrating, freedom to become the best that they could be. And God's promises can be trusted. But let's move on, or move backwards. There's another verse, verse 1, which is a little bit more difficult to analyze. Melissa, please. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. That seems a bit sexist, doesn't it? Well, what's going on here? Well, the firstborn male is a direct reference to the tenth plague, the last plague that told, the death, told of the death of every firstborn male in Egypt, whether rich or poor, and led finally to Pharaoh releasing the Israelites. Again, did this happen? Did every firstborn Egyptian boy die? Should we take it all literally? And I might risk being excommunicated or having my license rescinded, rescinded, but I'd prefer to focus on the symbolism here and what this story tells us about God. The symbolism that has all the plagues, all ten plagues, aligned with a list of Egyptian gods. And this particular plague for the Israelites was a challenge to the power of the Egyptian god Isis, the god of the moon who protected women and children and was closely linked to the throne. Here's a direct message. The direct message that Yahweh, the God of Moses, was more, more powerful than any of the Egyptian gods, and in this particular case, more powerful than this Isis. The symbolism continues. The metaphors flow. God spares the firstborn of the Israelites, and therefore they are special. They're chosen. They're set apart. It's symbolic. It's a reminder that in the celebrations at Passover, the firstborn is a cue that God has chosen not just that child, but all his people, and they all have a task to do. The book, the whole book of Exodus, is wonderfully written. It's a fantastic story. The story of Moses has so much to tell us about God and his relationship with his people. And the themes continue. The story actually continues to this very day. And again, Melissa, I'll ask you to read from the New Testament as the same message is reiterated. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, yes, the story of God's people continues. God's invitation to being a chosen people extends beyond the Israelites 1,500 years before Christ to the Jews in Jesus' day and then from then to all of us as the early church sought to share God's message of freedom to Jews and Gentiles alike in the first century and beyond until today where we welcomed Elsie as a special young person, a special child, called to be part of God's church today. It's a story of thousand years old, thousands of development, as God continues to call, call people to his heart today. You see, you, me, are, those, are now that chosen people. We have been set apart, and we have that freedom to live radically different lives in the world today. Now, when you look at Mo Farah, you can see he's different from you and me. Well, certainly me. He looks like an athlete. He talks like an athlete. He performs like an athlete. He's been freed to do the job he was called to do. And he looks and acts the part. And I wonder how many athletes in this year's Commonwealth Games or this weekend's World Championships have been motivated by him and set to, to run by his example because a good role model is infectious to their cause. 
I'm going to get sacked for this. But on the other hand, when it comes to choosing a prime minister, the task is a little bit more difficult. What does a prime minister look like? Do they have a special set-apart style to them? Do we know what the next week one will look like when we see them? Will they grow into the role? Or when the, those in the Tory party sit down to consider the options ahead of them? But as this present incumbent of number 10 has discovered, and it's not a party political point, that when what you say as a prime minister doesn't match what you do, then you hit problems. And Billy Graham sets a very high standard for what he sees as a difference to being set apart for us as Christians means. The transformed Christian loves when others hate. They're just when others are prejudiced. They're understanding when others misunderstand. And they are poised when others are frantic. And just like our Prime Minister, a new one will grow into the role, we hope, and pray. Mo Farah didn't just become that perfect athlete overnight. He grew into that role. And so we, as God's chosen people, through the transforming power of the Spirit, aspire to grow into all that we may be called as Christians to be, living locally here. And Pope John the Paul II follows it up with his thoughts. And he says, it is Jesus who stirs in you the desire to something great with your life. To refuse to be ground down by mediocrity. To have the courage to commit yourself humbly and patiently to improving yourself and society. Making the world more human and more familial. And just like the Israelites were freed and transformed in Exodus, and that journey was not an easy one, so we too have been freed by the power of the cross, purified and transformed to live lives holy and set apart to serve God, the church, and our community. And like Mo Farah in athletics, we are called to look, believe, and act the part in the firm hope that through us, our friends, colleagues, and neighbours can ask what it is that makes us like we are. And they too might want to know more. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ali. Just a wonderful reality, isn't it? That we are called to live new and different lives with an identity and a purpose set apart to follow Christ, to become more like him. And our prayer, as Ali has just said, is that we might be purified and transformed and changed to live a life of integrity, sharing Christ's love with the world. And so we're going to respond with some of that language in this beautiful song, Purify My Heart, Let Me Be As Gold and Precious Silver. So I'd like to invite you to stand if you wish, or to remain seated if you'd like to, as we reflect and worship as we sing this song, Purify My Heart.
since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's just take a brief moment to share Christ's peace with one another. Please do be seated. As we've been celebrating the joy of baptism, being community, being family together, we now come to this table as a family comes to a meal together, a spiritual meal as a people chosen and set apart to serve Christ in the world and now to meet with him in this meal as his family. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and you love your creation. You gave your son Jesus Christ to be our saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels, praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends. And taking the bread, he praised you. He broke this bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. And again, he praised you. He gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him, we plead with confidence his sacrifice, made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life, the cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So, Lord of life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favor on your people. Gather us into your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours. O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread.
to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. And so come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would love to love him more. Come because he loves you and he gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. I'd like to invite those who are helping to administer with me to come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Done. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah. Ali, if you and I go. you are baptized and would usually receive communion um, in your own church, if you're visiting, please do come forward. If you prefer not to receive for whatever reason, be, feel free to, to come forward just to keep your hands down and we'd love to pray a blessing on you as well. So please do come forward, make your way up through the aisle and just peel off um, around the side of the church.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ give you an eternal life. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ give you an eternal life. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ give you an eternal life. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ give you an eternal life. So we come now to pray, our post-communion prayer. Let's pray together. Grant, O Lord, we beseech you that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your governance that your church may joyfully serve you in all godly quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just before I invite us to sing our last hymn, just want to share a few notices, a few things that are going on, have been going on. Um, first thing I want to share is just uh, to give you an update on uh, Alpha. Um, most of you know that we've been running Alpha for a number of weeks now. It's been a, a joy to be a part of. We've been having a great time. Uh, yesterday we had our Alpha Day Away, which is an extended period of time coming together as community, learning, eating loads of food, enjoying the sunshine, great barbecue and looking at the, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And it was just such a joyful time together. So I want to thank, again, everyone that has been part of Alpha, everyone that helped yesterday as we start to draw that to a close and uh, move beyond Alpha to new, to new pastures. So just wanted to update you as the church. That's been a really encouraging um, program course that we've been doing together. And it reminds me that, of course, Alpha is just a kind of a micro version of church, really. That's what it is. And we come together as a larger representation of church. And um, many of you know that um, over the past few months, we've been thinking about praying about the vision that God has for us here in Attenborough. And there's been a visionary group that's been meeting together. We've been sharing these thoughts and reflections with the PCC. And there's um, a number of things that over time um, we'd love to share with you, some great exciting opportunities of things that we can be doing here at St. Mary's to reach out to our community with the love of Christ. But I just wanted to share one particular thing that we have discerned to be, I think, the right way forward, particularly for our Sunday pattern of worship. Um, I've really enjoyed coming out of the pandemic just being together as one family on a Sunday morning. We've had less services, but it's been so good just to meet together, and there's been a real stability in our fellowship, I, I have felt, and I hope you've appreciated that too. 
But it also makes us aware as time goes on that with that one service, we're not able to necessarily worship in a whole sort of variety of styles. Um, it does mean that we have to sort of try to do everything in one service. So what we feel is the right thing to do is to have two services on a Sunday, one which will be a brand new um, informal contemporary service um, where we hope anybody and everyone will come to, but with also another a secondary focus, well, a, a primary focus really, of reaching out to our congregation with new and different people, but also retaining um, a service which is perhaps more f familiarly sort of tradition in the St. Mary's tradition. I was talking to someone else the other day, traditional could mean anything, but something which is a little bit more formal, as it were, that you might be familiar with. Um, we'd probably be looking to launch that in sort of September time, seems the ideal time after summer. So that will be two services. We're still logistics and resourcing to work out as to exactly the timings and how we do that. But that's just something for you to be um, hopefully looking forward to, to be praying about. And if there's one thing I'd like to say is that I really don't want us as a church to think, oh, a new contemporary service, that's for young people and different people. A traditional service, that's for older people. Really, I hope that many of us might even attend both services or those of us might like to try different styles of worshiping as well it's really not about splitting it's about enabling us to worship um, in, in different ways and to enjoy the beauty and the richness of a diversity of worship and to reach out to our community and grow in joy and love together so that's something that's going to be coming in the autumn term and i'll share more details with you but i hope that's at least helpful for you now i'm really excited and i hope all of you are as well um, we tend not to have, as you'll have noticed, a collection um, hand, being handed around on a plate. That's sort of a, a COVID thing that's continued. Um, I think there is a slide, but it doesn't matter too much. There is a contactless machine at the back of church, but basically what I'm saying is um, if you would like to give, there's no pressure to give, especially if you're visiting, but if you would like to give at all, there is a plate for cash, but that, our new machine has been working really well, so if you would like to use it, it is, it is there, and there are a number of other ways that you can give, um, but that's just for your information. Finally... I have some bands of marriage to read, which is always a joy to celebrate upcoming weddings. So, get myself to the right page. So I publish the bands of marriage between James Andrew Carefoot and Hannah Irene Morgan, both of this parish at St. Mary's Attenborough, but um, being married elsewhere. This is for the third time of asking. And I also published the bands of marriage between Alex James Worthington and Emily Jane Duffield um, of the parish of St. Helen Staple, Stapleford, but with qualifying connections to marry here. They're both a uh, loved couple, um, regular worshippers here at St. Mary's. And this is also for the third time of asking. And if any of you here know any reason in law why these couples may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. Excellent. That's three bands, all good to go for those couples. <laughs> Shall we just take a moment to pray for them? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage not only for the love that two people can share in a committed partnership, a committed life partnership, but Lord, for the symbolism that it evokes of your love for the church, for your love for us. We pray for James, for Hannah, for Alex, and for Emily, that you would fill them afresh with your love, that they might share that love more profoundly with each other, that you might bless them on all their practical preparations. Lord, may you give them peace, comfort, and may you provide for all they need for a joyful and committed and blessed married life together, we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite us to sing our final hymn together. We always have tea, coffee, and refreshments. Please stick around. If you've got a bit of time, we'd love to get to know you more. The sun is shining outside. Take your coffee, your tea outside. Um, I'd love to chat to you, so would many of us. But um, I'm going to invite us now to sing our final hymn. Rejoice, rejoice, Christ 
is in you, the hope of glory in our hearts. Let's worship together. Please do stand if you're able and would like to. us and watch over us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look kindly on us and give us his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be with us all, our friends, colleagues, neighbours and our families, this day and forevermore. Amen. So go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.